Hi, and welcome to my tutorials on Euclid's Elements, Book 8. This video presentation is going to be on Proposition 6 of Book 8. Now, in this proposition, we have a series of numbers that are continuously proportion, proportional. Now, it doesn't matter how many numbers we have. Um, we're demonstrating this with five numbers, but it could be a um, sequence of proportional numbers of any size. And what we have is continuously proportional, which means A is to B, as B is to C, as C is to D, as D is to E. Or if we're talking about a set, a finite set of proportional numbers, we have S1 is to S2, as S2 is to S3, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that is missing from this proposition is the idea or the statement that it is, it is assumed that these um, numbers are in increasing size. So S of I is less than S of J if I is less than J. Um, it's just a momentary lapse, I guess, on Euclid's part. This proposition has if... A does not measure B, or in a more generic sense, if the first element of the set does not measure the second element of the set. If those conditions are true, then there is no element of the set S of I that will measure another element of the set S of J. I put in the i is less than j just because we're doing it in increasing order, but because it's an increasing order, we probably don't need this qualification. But um, no element in the set will measure any other element in this set. So that's what we're trying to prove. So let's begin our proof. First, we have that s of 1 is not measuring s of 2. But we do have that S1 to S2 equals S2 to S3 and S3 to S4. So we know that if S1 does not measure S2, then SI does not measure SI plus 1. If you think of it in terms of the A and B, since A and B equals B to C, if A doesn't measure B, then B doesn't measure C, because otherwise the ratios wouldn't be equal. So we've just shown that A does not measure B, B does not measure C, C does not measure D, and D does not measure E. But does A measure C? Can we sort of skip one and say, well, does A measure C? So let's look at that possibility. So let's take the um, A, B, and C and find the least numbers f, g, and h using Proposition 33 of Book 7. So remember, f, g, and h are the smallest numbers that can be used to express the continuous ratio of a, b, and c. So because they are this continuous ratio are equal, we have that a to c is equal to f to h, and that's from Proposition 14 of Book 7. Now we know that A does not measure B, and A to B is equal to F of G. So G does not measure F. So we have that G does, sorry, F does not measure G. Let me get that right. A doesn't measure B, F doesn't measure G. So we know that F is not equal to one, because if F is equal to one, by definition of the number one, it measures everything. So f is not equal to 1. Again, looking at our f, g, h, if we take um, f and h, they are relatively prime. So h is not measured by f. So f does not measure h. And again, because a to c is equal to f to h, if f does not measure h, a does not measure C. So thus we have shown that A does not measure B. If A does not measure B, it also does not measure C. And if we wanted to continue this, we could very easily show using exactly the same logic that A does not measure C, 
or D or E. But does B measure D? Well, again, we would just do the same logic as we've done already. We already know that C does not measure B, so we would have B, C, and D as our numbers for ratios, do exactly the same logic and show that B does not measure D or E, and likewise that C does not measure D or E. So it's exactly the same logic always, no matter which two elements that you're trying to compare, whether or not they measure each other. So the summary of all of this is that the element of J is not measured by the element of I, where I is less than J. And that is what we were trying to demonstrate. So that concludes this proof.